You're going to get fired. You're going to be in so much trouble. Yes, I want the Maserati. Yes, I want the Academy Award. I wanted it when I was 12, and I still want it to this day. I'm excited you decided to talk with me. We've talked with Carol Burnett, Ed Asner, and wow. several, yeah, several others. So we're doing pretty good. Um, and so the first thing is to give yourself an introduction as if we were filming a real documentary. <laughs> okay. As long as this is a fake documentary, we're cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Larry Hankin. And I'm an actor, and I've been in a, a lot of stuff that you've probably seen or not. But you're going to have to take my word if you haven't seen me that I'm an actor. And uh, this is an interview about that very sub subject. Right okay, on. Deb, take it away. All right. So, obviously, well, like I said, everybody has a story of how 2020 unfolded for them. The year of the pandemic. How was your year? Well, my, my year, uh, I planned for it, uh, right. actually years in advance. So I, I didn't do too badly. I didn't go through a lot of stuff that a lot of people went through. I mean, a lot of people went through some bad stuff. Uh, I've heard from my friends. Uh, you see it on the news. But uh, the reason that I did, I, I think, a little better than most is not only am I an actor, but I write. I, I Write. I make little film shorts, so I write mm. them and then I make them, you know, with with my own money. And then they're small, two minute, three minute, five minutes. But whenever I have free time, that's what I do. I sit down and I and I write. Uh, and I always have these ideas coming. So about uh, two or three months before COVID was even born in our mm. vocabulary, right. I was writing. I was writing and I needed more time. Uh, I was doing a lot of favors for friends, being in their film shorts, being in things that I was being actually paid good money to do. But I didn't have time to write. So I was, you know, really complaining to myself about not having time. And then COVID hit and everybody stopped going out and uh, couldn't go into restaurants and all that crap started to happen and I was trapped in my house I, I at, at the moment uh, I'm not affiliated with a female so I had a lot of that time of you know dating and mm -hmm. being with somebody and paying attention to them and they paying attention to me and I didn't have that to right. deal with so I sat down and I started to write and I wrote two screenplays in the time that I was sequestered and uh, all the time that I was writing, I didn't have to wear a mask because mm -hmm. I was in my own home. And uh, I would just go out for supplies, you know, yeah. food, <laughs> and medical attention, what, whatever was needed yeah. at, at the moment. And so uh, I finished two screenplays. Uh, so now I've got to... Uh, rewrite them is, is right. the word i mean you don't have to rewrite the whole thing you, you edit mm -hmm. them you know revise but, so that's what i'm doing now and as i live in california so we're coming out of the covid thing yeah uh, we're we're doing a little better than everybody else so and i live near the beach so everything is opening up i, I walked around last night i live three blocks from the beach Ooh. so there's a lot of bars and a lot of restaurants and People just go down to the beach to watch yeah. the sunset. And so it's very packed and crowded now in my area. And people are not wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still not over that. I still have the, PTS, the PTSD of, of COVID. You know, I yeah. walk around people and turn my face and wear a mask. And I was yeah. wearing a double mask. Well, my hair is gray, man. I, w I was one of the danger demographics but you know i have my my shots so i'm cool uh and most of my friends have had their shots a lot of people in the neighborhood have had their shots so yeah. i'm okay so i can't give you a, a you know a hard luck story because oh, yeah. i i i didn't actually plan for it but it turned out that my plans fit into the covid 
uh, system yeah, <laughs> in writing. And so you were, you were mentioning that you wrote a couple of screenplays. I did a little yeah. bit of writing through this for my first ever time. Um, what is what was your process like? How how was it sitting down and actually writing? Okay, I'm going to write a full screenplay. Well, it's not easy. Right. <laughs> uh, but what my process was, it's, it's different for each screenplay because the idea doesn't fit into every paradigm of what you think you're going to need. Uh, but by writing two, one right after the other, not in, in, in the same way, uh, I, I started to develop my own way of producing a screenplay out of nothing and thin air yeah. and stupid ideas. And you kind of finally get something going. Uh, what I did was, uh, the, the first thing was I wanted to write a screenplay. I, I really wanted to. I was finished. Uh, I was getting tired of writing film shorts. So I wanted to write. It. So that was there to begin with. And it was just bothering me. And that was there for a couple of months. And then um, I thought, well, let me let me write with something I already know. Uh, as a kid, I was always watching a lot of horror movies. Now, the difference is that horror movies have kind of grown since I was a kid. Uh, you know, we just had vampires. Now you have to have a vampire from outer space. <laughs> he has to have three heads and a sister who's a Gorgon. And there's a dragon involved. Uh, so it's not the same. <laughs> right. But I, I wrote what I knew. Yeah. And I, I tried to update it by making it a relationship kind of movie. In other words, it was it was there was a vampire there is a vampire in it but it had a okay. twist you know it wasn't your ordinary vampire so i got that okay it's got to be something that nobody yeah. thought of before and and i did that i can't tell you it's okay because it's the, it's a twist uh so there's a vampire in it uh but he doesn't come in until the the second act begins it the second act begins with uh oh here comes the vampire so the first act, I had to then make up some some way of, of getting to the vampire. That was the hard part because vampire movies, horror movies, chiller movies, thriller movies aren't the same now. So that's when I invented the relationship. So I had the first act is a relationship okay. that changes because a vampire shows up. So oh, okay. I, I had to set up the relationship and then the vampire makes everything different. Right. And uh, one of the things that I came up with then that fit into what's going on now was in the, uh, as I was working on the relationship, you know, and it's only like, well, 25 to 30 pages, which I guess is a lot of writing actually. It's not like a first act, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, as long as I had a, a guy and a girl and they were married, I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, if they get involved with a vampire, then what's going on in the movie world today? Well, one is horror things, but with a science fiction based yeah. background. Uh, well, it's a mix and a match. That, that's not, see, I'm living in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So they don't talk the way we talk. What, what, what they, you know, I say it's vampire with, with a science fiction overlay. But what they say is mix and match. You can take genres nowadays yeah. and mix them. You can take a cowboy movie and a horror movie, or you can take a detective movie and a thrill. You can, and get three or four in one. That's what they want. Yeah. So I yeah. thought, well, what do I have? I have a vampire. I have a relationship movie. But if I take the girl and make her the hero, then I got a female, uh, you know, uh, hero. A hero. Yeah. And, and that's heroines are big now. So, you know, the, the, the day of the women has come. So I have a vampire relationship, female. So, oh, okay. Well, I got a kind of a mix in the match. So that was my process. That's not a good way to go. It's a good way is is to actually have the idea, yeah, the ideas. A, a, a killer idea, right? And then you you work within that. The rule, I guess, there's only one rule. 
mm. of writing a screenplay. There's only one rule of writing, but there's only one rule of writing a screenplay. Do, do you happen to know what it is? It's pretty famous, but nobody knows it. But nobody knows it. Well, there's one rule. Well, I mean, if I tell you, you go, "Oh yeah, right." You're oh, gonna okay. go, "Oh, it's one of those." Right, yeah. One of those. Okay. I can't guess. Writing is rewriting. Okay. That's it. Yeah. That's all it is, man. And I'll tell you why, because I never knew why. People told me this since I was a little kid. You know, I would mm -hmm. write anything. Uh, well, it, it pertained to screenplays. It also pertained to novels. But it yeah. pertains to anything, pencil or pen or typing to paper, to, to the internet, to the digital, to the whatever, is that I didn't never understood. Well, no, man. Um, I talk to my friends and I just, you know, I'm a funny guy. I, I'm a funny guy. I was known as a funny guy in high school. He's a funny guy, man. And I would never rewrite anything. I would just, you know, hang out with the guys and I would just say stuff and they would laugh. Right. So I didn't rewrite. I, it comes out pure for me. <laughs> so I would just do that. But the difference is, and the reason for the saying is, when you're talking or when you're doing something, just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you only do it once. So if it's not funny, you don't even remember it. I mean, it's, you know, you were yeah, just yeah. talking. You don't remember what you were talking. But if you were talking and something was funny, then you might remember it. You know, I told this story yesterday. Let me tell you this story. So you tell it again. The second time you tell it, now, even though you knew it was funny the first time, the second time you tell it is the rewrite because you can't tell it exactly the same. It's oral. You know, it's going to be, it's just, you know, so already you've jiggered it. Even if it's the same story and it's same funny, I bet you if you typed it out, it wouldn't match. Yeah. You know, sentence it coming. Okay. So the third time you're telling it, you're telling it again, and then you're honing it. Now, I was a stand-up comedian, so this is what stand-up comedians do. They write it, then they tell it, then they hone it. They tell it again, and they tell it again. They don't rewrite it. They tell it again. Well, that's called rewriting. But when you rewrite a screenplay, you know, you got 90 pages. Oh, yeah. To rewrite that, that becomes a major job. And it really is, but it's just telling it again. Just tell it again, man, because it's it's it starts to you start to see and hear and read what you've written. It tells you what to tell. That's what rewriting is all about. And it took me years to to just stop the the stubbornness of no, I don't want to rewrite it again. I don't want to write it again. You know, I, it wasn't a rewrite. I was just writing it again. Why? I used to tell things and it was funny the first time no mm. it wasn't you honed it you you don't remember that but so uh that's what i learned out of the whole experience what i came out of the covid thing was aha i understand why i got the rewrite it's uh, because the second screenplay i basically was rewriting to a higher level i had a better idea that encompassed it but i was rewriting you know yeah so so that's uh, kind of what i came away with and now i'm rewriting a third one no I'm, I'm i'm writing a beginning a third one and i want to make sure that all the ducks are in a row now you know in other words i right. I, I, I want to have all the lessons in my head consciously before i i go you know instead of in the middle going oh crap, i forgot to gotta go back and do this so yeah. you know but but you know nothing like there's no free ride, there's no free lunch, and, and nothing is easy if you want it to be great. And Hollywood just wants greatness. And the, in other words, they, um, well, here's, here's the, what, the other side of it. So you've, you've, you've done all the rewriting, so you think mm. it's perfect, and it is, it really is perfect, yeah. and you hand it in. Well, now the other side has their own rules. Yeah. So the other side's rule is, if I say no, I keep my job. Boom. Now you. Right. Boom. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter how great it is. This guy is afraid if he says the wrong thing, if he if he if he uh, lets in the wrong screenplay. And here's the other thing, because he's got to let it in. He doesn't make the decision. 
So he, if he says no, he keeps his job. Great. So he doesn't have to worry. No, 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 no. And he keeps his job. He right. says yes, and it gets through. Well, he's not the gu final guy. It gets through. Now, it's still great. You wrote it, it's great. The guy read it, it's great. It goes through. And this guy who says yes or no, because he's the green light money guy, he's not making these kind of great movies. He's making science fiction horror movies. Yeah. And you wrote a relationship movie that's perfect. So... No, again. And that's kind so, of how I mean, it works it's, in I, You know, everybody's got their own agenda to get a screenplay through. So the only way you can get, if you're not hired by a, a green light money guy to write a screenplay of his idea, that's how movies get made. Right, right. <laughs> so you really got to bounce around. So a lot what of you got to do is make friends with green light money guys. <laughs> I guess, yeah, that, that would work. That, that would work. So that's what everybody who's writing a screenplay in this city is doing. They're networking. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for is a green light money guy. Yeah. Or if you happen to know a green light money guy, I'm going to make friends with you. You don't have to read, read my screenplay. I'm not going to give it to you. I just want to make friends with you. I, I mean, this is craven what I'm telling you. <laughs> this is Machiavellian what I'm telling you yeah. but that's the way the system works and every mm. once in a while rarely you know if you're going to film school or you you know a screenplay matches all three matches you write a great screenplay he reads it and likes it and this guy is making that kind of movie so one of the, the, the ways of, of, uh, of getting around all, all the machinations and machiavellian is to just Find out what people are buying mm -hmm. in the industry and in the end, you know, and then write those kinds of movies. So at least you got a shot. And if you're handing it to somebody who's going to hand it to somebody, make sure you're handing it to the guy who's handing it to somebody who's making the kinds of movies you wrote in front. Now, let's yeah. find out, well, who are you handing this to? You can ask the guy. I mean, they'll say, you know, are, are they making relationship movies or horror movies or what, what, what kind of movies is this guy making that you're going to read it for? And he said, well, you know, if he's making uh, road movies and you have a, a home movie, then don't even bother handing it to the guy, even if he thinks it's good. I, I had one guy like this. I mean, that's how I found out. Yeah. One guy, uh, it was for a different reason, but I'll tell you. I, I said, uh, he wrote, he, I handed it to him. He was a reader for a green light guy. Right. So I handed it to him. So he said, this is really great. I like this. Um, I, I really kind of would like to hand this in, but I can't. And I go, why not? And he says, well, there's too many typos. Oh, really? That's what I said. <laughs> and I go, are you kidding? And he goes, no, man. I mean, there's a, a lot of typos and um, uh, like uh, what they call typos are, are typos. I mean, it's just spelled wrong or something like mm -hmm. that. But also you have the sometimes you have the, the character in the wrong order or, or a character's name was left out. You know, it's just yeah. a mistake, you know, it's just. A, right. not, but that's a typo. Right. You know, there's anything that's wrong. So there's too many typos. So I can't hand it in. And he says, don't send it back to me because I won't read it. So in other words, you get one shot. Because, I mean, they got scripts coming from all over the world. Yeah, man. oh yeah. You know, I mean, so finally, okay. I mean, I, if I'm going on too long, but but this is what I learned over the, the, the COVID year because I was making phone calls while I was writing. I've got as much time as you've got. Yeah, oh, okay. So um, the, 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 there's a third way. And, and this also I learned from this guy uh, or one of these guys, because I kept on asking, who, who are you handing it to? What are they? What are they reading? You know? So it's like this. There's so many scripts coming in from all over the world. That Hollywood has stopped taking what they call scripts over the transom. Mm -hmm. You know what that is, right? You know, 
You know what a transom is? I, I think this is too old for some people. You know what a transom is? Well, that's what it's all about. I, I, no, I don't. I mean, no, I probably okay. do if I, if No, no, I'm, 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 but, but that's still what they use. That's if yeah. a, a transom is in the old days. I'm talking about even before I was born. Doorways, especially in offices, had a, a door, but there was a window above the door. It, it, it opened like that. It opened, okay. it just flipped up. You know, you can just go like this there's a thing on the side and it was for 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 a, a draft for for air for if it was too hot right. you open the window and the hallway and you get the breeze so what people would do is they would take screenplays and throw them over the transom really? to get them in yeah because they wouldn't fit through a, a letter thing in the hallway um so uh the brill building it came from new york in new york it was uh, uh, not only screenplay writers, but mostly it was songwriters, so song uh, distributors. The right. song distributors were in the Brill Building in New York. They had the transom. So songwriters would throw their stuff over the transom. And then the screenplay writer uh, readers would get offices and they would throw. And then finally they say, nothing over the, we don't accept anything over the transom. Hollywood still uses that expression but it means it's don't send us anything. We will not read it or accept it by internet, mail, a friend. It has to be from a lawyer or a festival. Really? Okay, so that's the setup. Yes, that's the setup. So if you want to sell your screenplay, get a, a, a show business lawyer or any, any, any lawyer if they have some idea about screenplays or something. Or now here's the festival thing, and and this is, this is the 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 one you could probably get your screenplay in. What what they do now because they have so many uh, submissions of screenplays in Hollywood to these production companies, that they don't accept anything. What they do is, they contact about twenty to twenty five festivals, and. There's lists all over about the best 25, the best 10 festivals. And they contact them and they said, when you have a screenplay competition, we want to read the first prize, second prize, third prize, fourth prize, and fifth prize. Yeah. Sometimes if it's a great festival, let's say, we will read, send us your top 10 winners. Top hmm. 10, not <laughs> five top 10 so so that that is the the best way it may not be the easiest but it's the most direct way mm -hmm. send your screenplay and you can do it in two steps you send your screenplay in and then they send you a lot of these festivals send you a a, a review of it you know they'll break it down they say okay. well the first act is kind of slow uh, yeah, more twists in it, wh whatever, whatever the thing is. So you get it back from the festival, make your correction, change the name. Sometimes you don't have to change the name, but you write and, and send it back in or send it to another festival. And that one, in, since you ha have some feedback and you rewritten it, mm -hmm. uh, it, it had, you have a good chance of uh, being a top 10 winner. You know, if you got any sense and any talent at all, yeah, most 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 people don't even know the correct format for a screenplay. Yeah. That's why Hollywood stopped receiving over the transom and anything. It's no, it's too many typos because that's normal when you're typing, and and yeah. that's why you have readers. And and the, and the other rule is don't correct your own screenplay just don't do it and i'll tell you why because you've written it you have a habit of reading it mm -hmm. and so you skip your typos you do not see your typos that's why you have to have somebody else use a typo so you have somebody else read it read type you get correct it and then boom and you send it in. so those are the th the, the three ways of uh, of doing it you know and they're all hard and it takes a lot of time and as an actor, I don't have all that time, you know, because I'm memorizing my lines yeah. or working. 
or looking for work or auditioning or I have a girlfriend or I, I got friends or I want to ride my bike. <laughs> just yeah. Too yeah. many and things. So there you so, go. You got 2020. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, that, that's, that's my, my take on screenplays. It's, it's very difficult. And, you, and, and unless you are, unless you have OCD mm-hmm. or really believe that you're, you're, you're brilliant and you got a great shot at doing it, uh, just you're outnumbered by people who don't know their ass from their elbow. Right. You're just outnumbered, man. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, and then that's, uh, that's terrible because, uh, you know, some people write great screenplays and it never sees the light of day because they handed it yeah. to the wrong person. It has nothing to do with the writing, you know? Yeah. But, but maybe, now just maybe, that's what life is all about. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you were shining shoes or a CEO, there's stuff in the way. <laughs> anybody can be anybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, anybody can be anybody and you can write anything and there's still Yeah, I don't think anything is really I I always thought as a youth that there's some things that are easier than others. Like all right, let's take uh, for instance Bob Dylan. Right. Now you think well it just pours out of his head and he just writes it down and he writes some music and the research because I happen to know the research that that guy does would just turn you away from poetry completely. Yeah. Uh, and, and athletes the same way. The time they put into practice, weightlifters, baseball players, violinists, anybody who you look up to yeah. somewhere, they put in an incredible amount of time to get you to venerate them. And all you see is the detritus of all that, the leftover, the Dylan song. That's a leftover. Yeah, of really, really, yeah. Years and years of putting in the time. Now, you know, yes, he is a genius. Now, he can absorb more than me or you but but still people who aren't geniuses make it they put in the work and 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 that i didn't learn until i was mature i thought oh well you know something is easy but i didn't realize the time that i put in i used to be a great improviser but that's a muscle you have to rehearse it's like it's like being an athlete but i used to just get up on the stage and just off the top of my head and have people in the audience you know it was a a group the second city and the committee. And I said, we used to, you know, just Saturday night, you know, Friday night, Tuesday night, get up on the stage, you know, what do you want? Doctor on a bus, okay. And he's got uh, acne, okay, cool, got it. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right off the top of my head, laughs, yay, yay. And I never really thought about the hours of rehearsal, you know, three, four, five times a week from 12 noon till five to be able to do that yeah, yeah. on Saturday or Tuesday night. And I never thought of it. No, I can just get up there and, you know, throw me something. I'll get, you know, and now when I'm, I'm acting and they say, you know, well, you can improvise this. It's, Duh. I don't have the, the, the chops, you know, the muscles, you know, the, it's, it's gone. Much. It's atrophy. Yeah. You know, that was, that was when I was young and rehearsing all the time, you know? Right. Like, yeah. From what I'm improvisation, I I have done in in theater. It's oh, it's such great fun when you can do it. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's just man, and you and you just you you just drop all that rehearsal and you know, or or all the you know. Well, what are you doing? In other words, they're doing it wrong. I'm doing it right. You know, no yeah. no writing on stage. You know, no it's all none of yes that. And. Yes and right yeah. And, and this guy is knowing what the fuck. You know, <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> you can't do that. You have to go along with it, you know, even though yeah. the guys. So, uh, yeah, it's it's all very interesting, you know, if yeah. you can get through it. So that's OCD helps. It, I guess it would. Um, okay, cool. So 
that was awesome. And then the next section is just a little... In my emails, I guess I describe it a little bit. Uh, it, it's quite a big question, but um, your story. It's probably quite long, but if there are some highlights um, of your story that you'd like to share, or a little bit of how you began acting, stuff like that, if there's anything that you could tell us. Um, how I got to where I'm sitting here talking to you now? In a way, <laughs> it's. I know it's a it's a huge question. Well, okay, no, I, I, that's cool. I I stand. I started up n nowhere. I I, st I came from Far Rockaway. I went to Far Rockaway High School. I went to Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Graduated as an industrial design. I always wanted to be a painter. Those are my paintings up there. Oh, uh, cool. I have thousands of them. Do uh, you? No, I wow. have thousands. Uh, but I have 40 of them on now. Uh, I might as well give myself a little commercial break. Uh, the Plug real Larry .com. If you go to the real Larry .com, it's called the real Larry .com because Larry .com is owned by somebody who's trying to hold me up for ransom. Oh, buy it back. And I go, you know, uh, so he's got, so if you go to Larry .com, it's dead, right? It's just, there's nothing. But he owns it, so I can't mm -hmm. use it. So the real Larry Hankin .com, and there's like 40 of these paintings. I got some of my paintings on T-shirts. I just came up with a new T-shirt. Uh, well, I won't show it to you until oh. it's released. It's going to be released next week. Right. Okay. Um, next so, week. Well, then you can show it because this isn't going to be released for until after. Well, long well, after that. Let me see. This is. I don't. Know, do you know that uh, I, I'm I'm one of one of the roles I have is Mr. Heckles on Friends. Do you yeah, know, Friends. Do you know yeah. that. Okay. So um, uh, I've done a lot of things. So this is one of the T-shirts that's coming up. Keep it down. There you go. And it's Mr. It's Mr. Heckles. So you design it just like that, eh? Right on a sheet yeah. of paper. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's a little better, and, and and this is he's a little funnier, but it's basically that. I, I sometimes uh, for the guys, there's no birds on it. For yeah. the girls, for the and they come in different colors. But for yeah. the girls, there's because you know Mr. Heckles has birds and cats. Yeah. You know. So there's the birds, and then there's a cat over here is about to pounce on them and eat them. Uh, so there's a cat over here. So that's for the girls who want to wear them as uh, n n nighties, night cool. night shirts. You know, cool. so so the but the guys don't have the birds and the cats. They just have to keep it down. So but uh, but okay. So that's that. Um, so anyway, I started out as an industrial designer, and that uh, so I, I got a degree in industrial design, but I didn't want to be one. I just did that because my parents wanted me to go to college, and I was trying to be a good son. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I graduated, the good son went right out the window. Uh, I don't think I, I, I didn't have a good upbringing. So, I mean, that, that, that's why. Mm. Uh, uh, and so I, I kind of ran away okay. <laughs> uh, at, at age of 18, I, I or 18 or 19, I, I ran away from home. Um, I kind of cut my parents off and my parents cut me off. Uh, right. I was disinherited. So, so there was a, mm. yeah. And, I, and that was cool. That was great. Cause it made it official. Then I, 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 okay. So, I was bereft of any kind of support. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to do anything. And so uh, Carl Gottlieb, who wrote Jaws, right. was my best friend in, in Syracuse University. And he oh. always wanted to be a writer. So I was about to go to uh, Detroit to design uh, cars for, um, I think it was, Ford or Chevrolet, I don't remember. And what year is this? This is a 1950, 1960. 1960, okay. 1960. Cool, yeah, I collect like old right. magazines, car magazines and stuff, so. Oh, well, I had the entire collection of Mad Magazine in 1960. <sighs> really? Of Mad Comic Books. Do you know how much they're worth today? A lot. About five hundred thousand um, dollars. I had the entire collection. That's the I worst thing. I saved every about... comic book. 
Still and have then it? when I moved, that was I didn't want to pack those. They were too heavy. It was a stack, you know, huge. So I just left them. Damn. Okay. So I, I saw so I was not only bereft, I was stupid. So uh, I, I moved out and um, Carl said that he in, at Syracuse said uh, he's going to Greenwich Village and starve and become a writer. So mm. I said, oh, that sounds like more fun than going to Detroit and becoming a designer for a huge amount. It's, it was like seventy five thousand dollars a year. And I chose to go to Greenwich Village and starve instead. Weird, but but happy. I mean, I made the right decision. Somehow, I never looked back or thought, wow, why did I do that? No, that was great. So I starved for a while. And then I was going to uh, open mic nights because I uh, finally got a job uh, uh, mopping up uh, duck boards behind a bar from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I was locked in in a bar in Greenwich Village. Uh, so I had my e evenings to myself. Uh, Carl would write during the day. I, I just wandered around during the day. And at night, I would go to the coffee houses. And I would see, and I used to be a funny guy. So I would go. Used to hey, be, come on. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, used, <laughs> I used to be a funny guy all the time for friends. <laughs> now I don't have that many friends. I have to be funny for other people for pay. Mm. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference in motivation. I guess, and intent. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I thought, well, you know, I'm a funny guy. I can, I can do that. No, 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 you can't Larry. <laughs> it's not that easy because making your friends laugh in college and high school is not like getting up on a stage in front of people who paid money to laugh. Mm -hmm. It's a different motivation on both people's parts on both ends so i wasn't funny at all but for some reason i just kept on saying oh i could do it better next time mm -hmm. yeah. and it would get me back you know for the next open mic night so then i just started this because we, we were in the village we were living in the village i just discovered that there's a lot of uh open mic nights there was open mic nights on tuesday wednesday thursday sunday Monday, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just uh, like Thursday, Friday and Saturday mainly was the money big, you know, uh, uh, headliners okay. <laughs> and coffee houses. Uh, and uh, so I used to start to get up and, and do it. But I, I, I was a fast learner because I, I was funny and, and I, I saw the how you. But again, but again, uh, I just realized that. Again, it was rewriting. In other words, I would if I would say something funny, I could remember what was funny. Like if I got up on yeah. Monday night, yeah, you only have five minutes, three to yeah. five minutes. So I mean, how bad can you be? People mm -hmm. would sit there with their coffee waiting for their friend to go on. You know, so <laughs> five minutes, they're not going to boo. They would just sit there silently. So the silence was kind of deafening. But I knew I wasn't getting laughs. So I would try. But if I did get a laugh, I would remember it the next oh, yeah. open mic night. And so basically I was I was rewriting. I would get up and I would say the setup to the funny line. I would get the laugh, try something new, yeah. but I would collect them. So after about five open mic nights, I'd have like a solid five minutes, you know, of all the different there you go. one liners. You know. And then I would collect them and he finally would have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That was like a set. A Woody Allen's manager comes in. Woody Allen had just graduated to nightclubs. He came in, and so I didn't know him. And then he started booking me in nightclubs. This this Woody Allen's manager. So in 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 Greenwich Village in those days, you weren't trying to be famous. You were trying to get representation. Okay. So if you had representation, you were king of Greenwich, Greenwich Village. Hey, I got a, I got a manager, man. Whoa. And everybody would, you know, gather around. You. How did you do that? Where were you playing? You know, what was your shtick? What <laughs> you just want to know you would go to where he was found and you would, it was weird. So I was a stand up comedian and uh, I started making good money and opening for big acts. So that's how I got into show business. It's just, I had nothing to do during at night and I opened mic nights manager i was opening for woody allen for a long time 
and then other big acts. And then um, I was I I got into um, critical thinking comedy. Okay. Uh, critical thinking comedy, like Richie Pryor, uh, George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, big, big into Lenny Bruce. Used to go watch him all the time. Uh, he would come see me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I wasn't that good, but he would come see me because he was a friend, you know, I mean, he was just being nice, you know. Uh, but I started being, when I did open for big acts like uh, Kingston Trio and stuff like that, I was being pulled off the stage by cops. I mean, I was getting a Lenny Bruce treatment. No, no, uh -huh. no screwing around. I mean, I was being, so uh, I couldn't take that. Uh, so I called my manager Woody's manager and I yeah. said, Hey, I can't, I can't do this. I'm not, I, I, I didn't grow up to handle cops pulling me off the stage and people booing and throwing stuff at me and coming at me with beer bottles. Get the fuck off the stage, man. Bring on the Kingston trio. Yeah, I had that. So it just unnerved me. Uh, yeah. so, um, my manager, uh, Jack Rollins, Woody's manager. Jack said, uh, look, why don't you join Second City? They do the same thing as Lenny and George and Richie, but they own the theater. So nobody's going to come at you with a beer bottle. Cops can't get in. You can do whatever you want. They own the theater. So so I did. I auditioned and I got in. And so that eased me. And then now I was an improviser. And then I told you about that. So that was fun. So I want to do that for the rest of my life. I, I would still be there. Uh, except Hollywood and the money just yeah. shakabukud me. Mm -hmm. they, they kidnapped me. Yeah. The money kidnapped me. So I joined, uh, I joined Second City. Then uh, a couple of us split and we went to San Francisco and opened up the committee from the Second City. So we were the committee and then we were right uh, a $35 round trip plane fare from Hollywood. That's what it costs to fly up to San Francisco and back, 35 bucks. So all the heavy hitters, the green lighters would <clears throat> hear about this really funny show, as funny if not funnier than Second City in Chicago, which was too far away to fly and stay overnight. And it was a big deal and a lot of money. So they would fly up, you know, and then they would either fly back on a, on a midnight flight or they would just stay overnight in a hotel, bring the kids, bring their wife, see the Golden Gate Bridge at least, you know, but it was still 35 bucks and what, two meals, dinner and breakfast and then boom, you're yeah. home. Uh, so we were being shakabuku, kidnapped from, from our stage into sitcoms. They would fly up, see somebody, tell the producer, call this guy. Not me, because I was too quirky. I was too tall, thin, and quirky at the time. But all my you know, fellow improvisers are flying down for, for a day or for a week to rehearse and come back. But they would always come back. And then after about a year of this, they wouldn't come back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would just... Hey, he called. He's not coming back, <laughs> you know, because the money was, you know, we were making maybe, I don't know, at, at best $500 a week when we were had lines around the block. I mean, we were a tourist attraction. We were yeah. as big as, as uh, Second City, but we couldn't match the salary. But the fun never was matched, ever. The freedom, the, yeah. the notoriety. So on the perks, you know, we were king of... King of Second, uh, King of San Francisco for for a while, for three years. Uh, the last three years, I mean, we were there ten years. The last three years, the place was ours, but they wouldn't come back. And finally, second mm -hmm. a second uh, uh, a second a company, and then a third company. And I still wouldn't leave. I was going down every once in a while. I'd, I'd go down, but I, I I didn't like I didn't like the people. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they were they weren't my sense of humor, right? So I would just always go back, and then I was directing, because now nobody I came in with was left, and and I was directing the third company, and they were all people from San Francisco.
because nobody is going to leave Hollywood to fly up to San Francisco for five hundred dollars a week or two hundred and fifty dollars a week just to be in a stage show. Yeah. Then they're, they're going to stay down there and audition for free for the book for the bucks. So uh, they, they the, the quality was going down. You know, yeah. there, there wasn't the challenge of being great. I mean, when I say great, I mean normal. You know, great around, around here is thrown around like it's like that's normal. Yeah. If, if you're normal and, and just a working actor, you're great. And I'm serious. It's hard to be a normal working actor. Yeah, okay. right. So anyway, uh, but finally, I got a call from uh, Laverne and Shirley from the production office. And they, they said, they called me at home. I don't know how they got my phone number, but they called me at home in San Francisco. said, hey, Laverne, uh, Laverne, uh, what was her name? Can't remember. I don't know. Anyway, her brother, her brother was the producer of, of Laverne and Shirley, Penny Marshall. Penny Marshall, the, so the production company called me said, Penny Marshall came up to see your show last week. And, um, and she said, get the tall guy. Uh, there's this dance scene in Laverne and Shirley, uh, and she wants to dance with him because I was a physical comedian. So I was hired to go down to Laverne and Shirley. So I had to be there for a week for rehearsal. So I just, you know, I was, I think I was directing at the time. So I just said, you know, hey, you direct. It didn't matter. Just keep, you know. Keep. Yeah. And I went down and in that time while I was, so I did the show and, and everybody liked me and, and Laverne uh, Penny liked me. I did, did a good job. I went back and I was there for another week up in San Francisco and I got a call from an agent saying, uh, I hear you were on the Laverne and Shirley show. I saw it. It was really cool. I went there and I spoke to them and they said, you didn't have an agent. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like one? I'd like this. Yeah. I had this. I heard this from Woody Allen's manager about yeah, yeah. a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, said, I said, I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you come in and talk? Are you going to be down here at any time? And I said, well, I'll take off a couple of days. I have 35 bucks round trick, you know, and I'll sleep at a friend's house. Okay. So I, because all my friends were down there by yeah. now, everybody has started with, I mean, they had mansions by now, <laughs> uh, literally Carl, Carl Gottlieb. So I went down, I slept on his couch, saw the agent. He said, you know, so let's sign up. So he signed me. So then I just couch surfed and until oh, yeah. so here I am talking to you. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Uh, I mean, well, you know, once cool. once you once you give up and go down there, that's it. It's all the same. I, even if you're a star or or just a, you know an extra, it, it's all the same. You're auditioning, stars audition, extras audition, everybody auditions. You just get a, a billion dollars, or you get you know five hundred dollars. It does. Yeah. It, it's it's just a a very small town all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And you're either living in the suburbs on the fringe and couch surfing, or you're living in the city, you know, Malibu and Hollywood, and, and you're making a lot of money. And, you know, you can, you can improvise your, you can say what you want, yeah. as opposed to, can I say this different? No, no, say it is written. Okay. Uh, yeah. you know, but I can say it funny, or just say it as written, please. You know, because they have to call the writer, then they have to call the producer. If he wants to change this line. Oh, come on. Give me a break. Will you? And, where did and you then end up one staying? day. What? Where'd you end up staying for the long term? Well, for the for the long term, what happened was, because I kept it up. I mean, I would just say, hey, can I, can I say this different? And they go, yeah, sure. Say whatever you want. What? Yeah, yeah just say whatever you want, you know. And I said, I just crossed a line. Yeah. And and it was just, yeah, say whatever you want. Because he doesn't know, the director who just said, yeah, say whatever you want. He doesn't know that I'm not allowed to say anything I want up until now. But after that, 
I could say anything I want. I mean, I, I wasn't going to improvise a whole page. I mean, I just wanted yeah. to change a word or a line. That was all. But no, until somebody said, yeah, say whatever you want. And it was about the size of my part, I think, was what he made the judgment on. I had a big enough role where if I changed one line, nobody's going to even notice. Uh, you know, because I'm just another character. And if I was given the responsibility of being this character, he's responsible enough to handle changing a line. You know, it's right, yeah. kind of like that. It's just assumed, okay, he can change. And then I, you know, it never bothered me because, you know, either I never wanted to change a line, I, I could remember it, or it was a pretty good line, or I just change it and not ask anybody. Nobody noticed. Now, there, there is always a, a script girl there. So somebody yeah. does, she's paid to circle the words. And sometimes I would just say, uh, there was only one time, it's a very sh short little story, but for Breaking Bad, Vince Gilligan likes to write. And he likes to write long speeches. And he liked my right. old Joe character so much that as a gift to me, he wrote an entire monologue. Monologue, yeah. Page, a page, one full page. And he didn't tell me. <laughs> it was just when I showed up. So I, you know, I, cause I have a dyslexia. I, so I have to learn lines. Yeah. I'm dyslexic. Oh. So I have to get the, the script uh, about a week before everybody else. And then that gives me enough time to read it. But I, but I, I, I don't get it like that. That's why I liked improvising. I didn't have to memorize anything. It would just come on. I would just flow off the top of my head. Yeah. So he wrote and then he just, they didn't tell me. And when I got to the set, it was just, on my script, they just handed me a script. What is this? Oh, Vince liked you, so he had one of the writers write you a monologue. No, I mean, I just lost it, man. No, you don't understand, no. I mean, I lost it to the point where the AD who had handed me the script, you know, and I said, wait a minute, and I just, what is this? He said, oh, Vince wrote you, had the guys write. No, no, mm -hmm. I lost it so much that he had to leave. He said, hey, man, I got to get back. He didn't want to be there. <laughs> he didn't want to answer any. Well, why? Why? Oh, just... He split. So I tried to memorize it and I couldn't, but I wouldn't. I wanted to do the part so badly that I didn't cop to it. I didn't say to anybody that I couldn't um, memorize these lines. I didn't okay. say. Yeah. So I said, how, how long do I have? And he said, two hours. I said, okay. And I tried to memorize it and I couldn't. Uh, so I just, and then finally, when the two hours were up, I said, uh, I, so I, I go to the set and the director says, it wasn't Vince. Uh, the director said, are you ready, Larry? Which he says to everybody, you know, you know, are you ready to go? Oh. And I go, yeah. He says, uh, you want to talk about anything? No, let's just do it. So I was just acting normal. Like there's nothing. And I, and he said, okay, and this, he was going to shoot the monologue. And he says, I said, you know, I figured out how to shoot this because I was trying to save my ass. Yeah. I said to him, I figured out how to shoot this. And he, he, he got, it got kind of insulted. He goes, you figured out how to shoot this, Larry? <laughs> and I go, yeah, because I, I wasn't thinking. So I said, yeah, yeah, I did. Because I'm trying to save my own ass. I'm not thinking about it. He's the director. <laughs> so I say, so he goes, oh, I'd like to hear this. Yeah. Oh, well, how would you direct this, Larry? You, you know, when they're saying your name, it's not good. <laughs> it's yeah. just not good. <laughs> it's not good. So he goes, oh, what is it? And I go, well, why don't we just break it up? See? So like, you know, I talked and you cut to him. Then I talked and then you cut to him. It was the Winnebago scene where the, the cop was outside and Brian and uh, Aaron were inside. And so they could cut inside and outside then to me. So maybe I figured, hopefully I could memorize in sections maybe. Right. So he listened to me and then he goes, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. But uh, we're going we're gonna to shoot it in one take. We're going to just <laughs> walk and talk. We're gonna, you're going to get down there about 100 feet down there. This is in the junkyard. 
is you get down about a hundred feet about from the from the Winnebago. Winnebago is right over here. Camera's right over here. So then you just walk towards the camera and just say the whole monologue <laughs> and end it as you get to the camera. And then and we have and there was a, a limo right here. There was a limo parked by the camera. Then he said, because we were out in the desert shooting Breaking Bad. Yeah. And he so in this junkyard and the limo there. And he says, so and when you get to the camera, we'll, we'll a yell cut, you're finished, hop in a limo, and it's going to take you to a production company, which was a, a 45 minutes away, because yeah. we were in the middle of the desert. And, you, and you're all through. How about that? So I go, okay. You know, <laughs> Okay. So you say anything wrong? I, no, no, nothing's wrong. So I get a hundred feet down. He says, "You ready?" I go, "Yeah." He says, "Okay, action," and I just improvised it. I just made it up. Now yeah. I had for two hours read the screen, you know, read the part. So all these images, and it was legalese. It was a legal brief, basically, to of of legal terms and laws that will keep the detective from going inside a Winnebago, which was on my property, and he didn't have a search warrant. So I had to legally, for a page, give him the reason, the legal reasons why he couldn't do that. So I just, I, okay, fine. He said, are you ready? I said, okay. So I start to walk and talk. And because his memory of improvisation was in my head, I tried to keep a flow. Yeah. So as I'm going, I didn't hesitate and I didn't say um or er. That was the only thing that I had in my mind not to do. Don't right. stutter, don't stop. Just keep talking, even if they have to slow it down a little, but keep the legalese going. And I keep on going and finally I go, and I get there at the end and he has cut. And I go, okay, now I'm going to be fired. <laughs> and he goes, okay, uh, let's just do it again just for insurance. And I didn't say anything, but I was shocked, man. And I go, holy cow, I memorized that entire thing. Thank God for improvisation. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what happened in a bit. But meanwhile, I had thought I had memorized. And there was something going on in his mind. He says, just go back there. Let's do it again. Anyways, it's just totally cool and calm and clear. Let's do it again. Like, like I had been in things many times before. Get back there. Go back there. And I said, well, I, I, now I can't fail. I, it's in the can. I got it. So I can even stutter if I want to, but I'm not going to. I won't do it the same, but he's got it in the can. I don't have to worry. I get back. He says, you ready, Larry? And I go, yeah. Now I'm jaunty jolly. And he goes, okay. And then the script girl. Remember the script girl? Oh, boy. She goes, uh, just a second, and she starts walking towards me. That's not a good sign. No. When the script girl is walking towards you, it means that you forgot something or left something out. So I'm still cool. I mean, okay, if I left something out, I'll just pick that up. I can remember one line if I memorize, if I left one line out or if a word, I can remember that, and I'll just fit it in somewhere. So she comes up to me and I, Mr. Casual, you know, I, I, I got this. I go, oh, OK, what did I forget? You know, like I forgot one line. So she shows me the script. Every fucking word is circled. Every word is circled. I have never in 10 years of 20 years of being an actor ever seen a book like that. <laughs> and I say, and I was stunned. And because I thought I had, you know, I'm, I'm home free. And I go like that and, and I go, well, but I got the gist of it, right? <laughs> and she says, the director wants you to say it as written. So I'm back oh, to square wow. one. I'm back to like three years back. And I go, I want to talk. I want to talk to Vince. That was my back, my backup. I want to talk to Vince. And she says, Vince isn't here. OK, I want to talk to the writer. The director wrote this. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then the director yells, 
anything wrong, Larry? And he knew exactly what was wrong. <laughs> so now he's just watching me stew. And he's, he's getting off on it. Anything wrong, Larry? No, there's nothing wrong, no. So he's, you want to continue? Well, what, what are we doing? Let's go. I said, all right, let's just do it. You, you want to do it? I go, yeah. I said, okay. All right. Uh, and then he starts walking towards me. And I say, no, no, that's, no, two people walking towards you is really bad. So he walks all the way up to me and we're just waiting silently. He gets up to me and then the cameraman, the cinematographer yells, don't you want to stand near the camera, Jake? And Jake yells, no, I'm going to walk with my actor. And he's got the book and I go, oh no, he's not, this is like kindergarten. He's going to walk <laughs> with me. I can't take this. I want to go home. I want to be fired. I, I really, I, I was just like, I don't want this to happen. And he says, do you mind if I walk with you, Larry? Again, Larry, no, don't forget my name. Just forget my name. And I go, no, I don't care. I mean, I, I, I would just, I, I, had, I had fired myself. I, I, this was now stupid. Why don't you just fire me and let me go instead of making me walk through this? I was just a, totally embarrassed. She says, no, I'm going to walk with you. Let's go. And he's got the book with him. And he, he's, and the, he yells to the camera, ready? I get rolling and action, Larry. And I'm walking and I'm just doing the same thing I did before, you know, making it up, whatever. Uh, I'm just don't, I'm an error. And I get to the end and I, I see he's standing right by me. He had called to the camera saying, where am I out of frame? And the frame was right here, right here. So he stood, you know, right there, yeah. you know, just out of frame. So he's that close to me. So I can see him as I'm walking and, and he's just keeping up with me and he's got his head buried in the book. And I'm just going and walking and walking. And I get to the end and he yells, cut. And he says, okay, Larry, dismissed. Everybody, Larry dismissed. Good job, Larry. Thank you very much. And I get in the car. Door opens. I get in the car and the, I zoom away. And I don't know what the fuck just happened. I have <laughs> no, really. no idea. And nobody would say anything, you know. And nobody now knew I was gone. They were back there and I'm going to the production company. I had to wait th uh, th two weeks. I called the production company to see when it's going to show. I wanted to see the episode because I wanted to see what happened. So I told my friends to watch it because I was going to give them a quiz afterwards to watch that show. So they did. They watched it. And uh, but two weeks later, I watched it. And I said to them, what did you uh, see? And he said, well, you were walking and talking with that legal speech. And Aaron and uh, Brian and Aaron were in the Winnebago and you were keeping the cop from going inside. I said, no, that's that's not what did you see? That's what you thought you see. But what did you see? <laughs> you were, you were walking and talking and you were talking to the cop and they were inside. And then and he were telling the cop to stay out. No, that's not what you saw. Well, what did I see then? What you saw was this. <clears throat> you saw me start with my first line, which I had memorized. <laughs> you made the first line. first line. You saw me start with my first line. And after my first line, you cut to the cop and you heard my voiceover. And then you cut inside to the Winnebago and to him and then him. And then you cut back to the cop and you cut back to me for one more line. And then you cut. And then what you saw was exactly nine seconds of Larry Hankin. And the rest was voiceover, the cop, Aaron and Brian. That's what, what you saw. They took both my improvs. And that's what the director knew from the from the second line I said. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, but it's all legal. So he he uh, edited together the best sayings of both improvs, put it as a line, and then whenever I said something either interesting or right, he cut to my face. Yeah. It takes exactly two to three seconds. For me to get one line out and they cut to me three times three six nine seconds 
and the rest was them. And you would never know it. And I asked all my friends and they said, no, you're walking and talking. No, I wasn't. I was just walking and talking for, for three seconds at a time. Yeah. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And it worked. And Vince never said anything. Nobody ever said anything. And I was in El Camino. Yeah. And he gave me a big speech in El Camino. <laughs> Same thing happened. And this time he just said, Larry, take a break and get your lines memorized. Everybody take 10 minutes while Larry memorizes his lines. So I went off 10 minutes. I memorized the lines. I came back. They shot it. And they said, great. OK, thank you, Larry. Goodbye. But I think that's the only time that that ever happens where, you know, I, I didn't I, I went up on my lines. But that's why I'm not in um, that law thing that Vince Gilligan is doing. What, what is it? Uh, uh, better Call Saul. Better Call Saul. That's yeah. why I'm not in Better Call Saul. Right. He uses all the people from. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. And, and a, a lot of people ask me, why aren't you in, in Better Call Saul? Because he likes to write big speeches and he knows he can't memorize them or he can't get them to me in time. Right. It, yeah. It, you know, so, uh, so. So that's that. That's cool. I was in, you know, two breaking bands in El Camino. It's fine. I worked with Vince Gilligan. Yeah. I, and then uh, and after that, by the way, after that, I, I, I retired. After, after El Camino? Breaking Bad, he called me for El Camino. That was after I had been retired. I came out of retirement oh, right. to do Breaking, breaking Bad. Uh, but now I just work. And if I can't memorize the lines, I just turn down the part. Right. You know, or I'll say, can you give half of this to somebody else? And I'll just memorize part of it. And they'll do that. Uh, or they'll, uh, they'll say, OK, well, we'll write you another part and, and we won't give you that much to say. And I go, fine, as long as <laughs> I don't have to memorize shit. You know, I can yeah. memorize actions, you know, like a dance yeah. movement or shit like that. I just can't memorize words. It's, it's really weird. Um, what, it's, it's an amazing what, it, what my brain does. If I look at a page, an entire page, it looks like one word. It looks like one long. It looks like A B C D X X X Z D F G F G H H H. Yeah. So H, how okay. how is that writing your own screenplay? Um, I write it one word at a time. It, it just, it, in other words, the connection is the same as improv. In improv, it's you say something and it goes from my inner ear to my mouth and out. Yeah. There's no consciousness. You got to let go of your what, what it's called. Uh, what is it called? It's called plotting. Plotting is consciousness. You yeah. got to let go of the narrative. You stop keeping track of the story. Just answer the guy's question. We're talking about birds. Talk about birds. Ba-doom. So it's the same thing. The, each speech, it goes from my head to my fingers. Yeah. My consciousness, if I start to plot, like, where is this going? It doesn't work. Like, okay. I'm going to write a speech about keeping a guy out of the Winnebago. That would be very difficult. I can do it. I just yeah. need time. Yeah. So it just takes me longer. It's not that I can't do it. It's just that if I have two hours, that's not enough time. A day, an yeah. evening, you know, I, yeah. I can do it. So if I see, uh, see yeah, it's it's it, it's kind of stupid and it keeps me from from getting these really big parts. I had to turn down a part that was a major part in a major movie and it was just too much problems. Yeah. You know, it, it would just uh, it would. It would it would screw up my days. I would just have to lock myself in my house for like weeks at a time. To, right. I don't yeah. want to. It's not, it's not worth it. Besides the fact that I'm not a born actor. I was never born wanting to be an actor. The money was good. Improv, that's what I am. Uh, yeah. You know, that, and I had 10 years of improv. Nothing, there was nothing ever happened on stage that I couldn't handle. And I did a lot of, I mean, we all did. A lot of amazing, how did he get, how did he get to that, up there. How did Larry Hankin get up there? Well, it was a series of improvs, man. Yeah. And I just I was into climbing. 
in the in the improv. It was an improv about climbing, or or an improv about second story. Oh yeah, you know, up or something about upstairs because I did climb up. You know, in improv, you have these doors you come through. Yeah. Whatever I, you know, doors. But we had a, a projection out onto the stage, so. Yeah. So the doors came out onto the stage like this and down. So you, you open the doors like this. So there was a flat thing up here. So I just somehow in the improv, I got up onto the, onto, I got on somehow, I, I think from the piano onto the thing, but it was, it was within a, a building. In other words, I was improvising, yeah. climbing a building. And so I was up there and the director thought that that was such a good improv that he kept it in the show because it was just another dimension to the stage that Larry had discovered. And then, so uh, within keeping it in the show, we just improvised upon improv. So I was all of a sudden all over the place. How did we write that? You couldn't write that. It was just like one improv speech after another or one yeah. line, or why don't you do that? And then, so that's how you write. You just, it's uh, and I do find that I can memorize my speeches in my film shorts a lot easier because it's a familiar to the inside of my head. You know, it came from in here. I mean, that's my reasoning. I don't know what the scientific thing is. I just know that biology. It's easy to that. What? Biology. Yeah, biology. Yeah, biology. Uh, but but also I do know from learning. Uh, I'm trying to learn guitar. Well, I, I have learned guitar, but learning guitar, I found that. Um, I've got to keep my consciousness out of it. In other words, I would try to think of how to make an A with my fingers. Yeah. Think about that. And it was awful. I couldn't do it, man. It was like memorizing, you know, Vince Gilligan's speech. But as soon as I just looked away, didn't look at my fingers at all, and just try to remember, my fingers remembered. I couldn't. My fingers did. So I thought, oh, there's a clue. My subconscious is recording all the time. My subconscious is healthy. Yeah. It's my consciousness that, uh, well, it's my father. I mean, that, that's my upbringing. He put the fear of, of father into me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, so my conscious, I'm always very aware of who's around me or what, you know. Yeah. Like, no, I understand and it's, that. So, uh, so I learned a, a lot by learning the guitar about, oh, that's what's getting in the way. So was, if I have to memorize anything now, I just had to memorize something. I just did a, sh um, I mean, I still, I still act, yeah. but I act on my own terms, you know, I either turn it down or do it. So I did a, a thing for a, a friend, a film short, that's going to be a movie. The film okay. short was a test for the movie. So I had to memorize a whole scene. But he gave it to me like, you know, two weeks in advance. And I, like, you know, I did it like that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was no no problems at all because I had the time. It was that yeah. simple. So. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, your story. That's how I do that. Uh, so the last part of the interview is just a, a piece of advice or a message that you find yourself giving to youth. Or something that you would say to me. To you. Well, I just gave it to me, and that is keep keep your consciousness out of it. Yeah, you know, and I and I think that's for art. Well, all art. Well, here's the thing. Um, you write a screenplay, or you write maybe a synopsis of an idea, uh, but you just keep writing. It's as as long as you keep going, your your consciousness fades as you as your as your biology relaxes in that there's no danger. Right. I, yeah. It's, it's so deep in the DNA that this is all subconscious what I'm, but, but it's what I, I've taught myself. It's yeah. just like going into a, a, a deep a beta state. Basically yeah. what I tell myself is remember the beta state, remember the beta state. The beta state is relax, relax. Relax. Cool. My father put fear in me, and it's still, you know, somewhere in there. And and if yeah. the, the right uh, things go, it starts to fill my consciousness, and I forget. Yeah. So in my case, inability to remember lines is has to do with a, a conscious fear. 
So a lot of people don't have fear. Like if I watch, I, I watch uh, a star, you know, uh, lead in a movie, and he's doing all these things. The, 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 the example that I give is: uh, Have you ever seen the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith? I might have seen it, but I, I might have seen it. Yeah. It's uh, with uh, Brad Pitt. And uh, okay. at the time, uh, he was going to his wife, uh, the Jolie, you know, mm-hmm. Angelina Jolie, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Well, there's a scene in it where they're fighting in a house. They're, they're, they have guns and they're fighting each other. They're shooting at each other. And then yeah. sometimes they fight with each other and wrestle. And then they're they're saying lines and saying plot lines and fight lines. And then they're fighting and then they're shooting and and breaking things and it's all over the house and i look at that and i go okay to me that's what actors do that's Mm -hmm. acting no it's also a show-off piece you know and it's a piece for a movie but i could never do that i don't care how much time you give me the fear factor of in the middle of it forgetting a line would well up and i would forget the line yeah fear it you will fear it. <laughs> it's basically yeah. what happens. Yeah. So uh, th- that's what. So that's what I can't do. Mm-hmm. And I and I know it because I'm not a born actor. I'm a born funny guy. I'm a funny guy. That's it, man. I can mm-hmm. stand up in front of an audience now and make you laugh because yeah. I got it in me and it blah blah. And I know it. But acting is a, a learned thing. So what I tell myself is relax get rid of the fear it's it's you know a, a stupid fear it's it's a mm-hmm. it's a fed to you fear it's not it's not something you're born with you uh so that, that's the only thing that i really keep on telling myself over and over again and the thing that i do to compound the exorcism is i uh, learn more and more music the, the the better I get on guitar, the more lines I can learn like yeah. that. It is a direct connection. And I know the connection has to do with music is totally unconscious or subconscious or, but it has nothing to do with consciousness. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't look at my fingers. I don't look at these, these fingers. I don't look at these fingers. Yeah. I don't, you know, it takes me a year. Well, like, it, take, it takes me a couple of days to memorize a song that I just wrote. But once I have it, I don't think about it. So I, I know what's bothering me and I have worked around ways to get rid of it. So, But the correlation between music and memorization to me in my life is a very definite, very real one. And the mm-hmm. more I learn guitar, so that's how I practice acting, by the way playing guitar every day i i give a half hour to guitar lessons yeah my, my own and then uh, especially if i have a, something to learn like this part i just learned this whole scene that i learned yeah. uh, just, uh, a couple of days ago i rehearse my guitar before i would rehearse the scene and wow. it would go much easier you know it sounds ridiculous and silly That's and simple but and interesting yeah. but for me it works you know yeah. So uh, I would also tell you, just figure it out. That's it. Okay. I'm, I'm going to just answer your question. Mm-hmm. What do I tell myself that I can tell other people? Yeah. And this is really true, man. This is deep. Figure it out. That's all you have to do. And nobody wants to. And that's why they can't. And it's as simple as that, because if I find it took me years to figure it out because I didn't care. I was lazy yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't incumbent upon me, you know. But when I finally had to figure it out, it took me a while. But I figured, oh, for me, it's the connection of music to memorization. Yeah. I mean, other people, you something else. But nobody is stupid enough to not be able to figure it out. I don't care how stupid you think you are. You were born with enough backup, exterior Mm -hmm. or interior drives to figure it out. And uh, that's the best I can tell anybody. 
No, that's that's awesome. I really like that. I haven't heard that. I mean, I've heard lots of different advice, but figure you just yeah, you can no matter how stupid you think you are, yeah, you can figure it out. That's awesome. And I I do kind of, I do have to wrap up soon. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I got you. I'm bereft, man. <laughs> no, it's, it's I'm all empty. Right. <laughs> it's okay. It's it's that's perfect. Um, but I I do appreciate you joining me on here and giving me your time. And uh, I do have to throw in here that I did really like Breaking Bad and Billy Madison and Home Alone <laughs> and all that. So, so me it's too. a pleasure. Me too. Thank you very much, man. I had a good time. Mm-hmm.